I've, um, I've spoken previously about the curious connection between precociousness, between early uh, genius as expressed in music and, and the same thing as we can see in mathematics. Uh, there are these prodigy mathematicians, there are these prodigy musicians. And of course there's some people who think that music is mathematics and that mathematics in a sense is music. So our next speaker, Jason Brown, is a guy who's made this connection and used this connection to decipher some interesting things in the music of the Beatles. This is Jason Brown. Hi. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. One, two, three. I'm gonna tell Aunt Mary about Uncle John. Said he's gonna blues, but he got a lot of fun. Oh, baby. Yeah, baby. Baby. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Toronto born and bred. I grew up in Toronto. I did my high school here. And then I went out to Calgary where I did math during the day. And I did music at night playing in bars till 1 a.m. Luckily it was calculus in the morning so I could sleep through that. <laughs> but then I came back to Toronto to do my graduate work. And then I ended up in, uh, at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Um, so I had music as an early love. I, I started playing piano, and then I heard a Beatles record, and that was it for piano. And I taught myself guitar, and I fell in love with Beatles music, and it lasted forever. Um, but then I started to do mathematics. It was an equal love. When I came to finish my undergraduate, I had to decide whether to do math or music. I chose the easy gig. I went and did mathematics. And I gave up music for a while, but then it came back to me. And I think one of the things that I want to um, bring across to you is that uh, you, in your life you do so many different things and you try to specialize in something and have a profession. But, so you have your professional life and you have your personal life. And I think the most creative thing you can do is rather than keep them separate, is to bring them together. And that's sort of the story that I want to explain here. So I'm going to be talking about something I call a hard day's math. And one of the fortunate things in being a professor is I get to learn, I get to study, I get to teach, I get to do research, I get to discover every day. And it's really a gift to be able to do all those things. I can't understand people who leave high school or leave university and never want to learn again. It is truly a gift to be able to learn every day and to find out something new. So, um, as a university professor, I get to choose my own research problems. So these are not problems that are sanctioned by the university. They want me to do other kind of research. But I want to ask some questions about music. So one of the questions I had was about why the Beatles conquered North America with I Want to Hold Your Hand. In 1964, they were famous all across Britain with songs like Please Please Me and She Loves You. There was Beatlemania there. They hadn't broken in in North America. They knew they were coming to play on the Ed Sullivan Show in February of, of 64, and they had to write a song that would break North America, that would conquer North America. And I can't imagine the kind of pressure, the creative pressure they were under. And they had to write 
a great song. And they wrote a great rock song, I Want to Hold Your Hand. But I want to point out a couple of things that I found when I was investigating the song. And I found out that no one has really asked the question, why is that song so great, musically and otherwise? So, uh, one of the things that I found out was that, um, that it's a powerful rock song. It is indeed a rock song. It's unlike any song that was around at the time. I can't think of a comparable song. When I looked at the melody, the melody had notes only in the key. Do you know what kind of songs typically have notes only in the key? Rock songs have the flat third and the flat seventh. That's what gives those songs their rockiness. When I sang Long Tall Sally, it opens on that flat third that's out of the key. So what songs have only melody notes in the key? Nursery rhymes. So why, by all reason, their song should sound like a nursery rhyme rather than a great rock song. So why does it sound like a great rock song? It's the math that they put into it. Now, I'm not saying that John Paul, George, and Ringo were mathematicians, but I am telling you, even if you haven't seen mathematics since high school, even if you're those people that I meet at parties who say, ooh, I've always hated mathematics when I tell them I'm a mathematician, even if you're one of those people, you use more mathematics when you play music when you use more mathematics when you listen to music than you can possibly imagine. So there is math in the song. The other thing that I want to tell you is that song to me sounds fresh. Every time I hear it, um, it's, it's like hearing it new. And I've heard it hundreds of times. So what makes the song sound fresh that you can re-listen to it over and over again? It's the math that's hidden in there. Now I'm going to, uh, we're going to play a, a small version of the song for you. And then I'll talk a little bit more about it. So let me tell you why I think the song is so great. One of the things that I want to understand, they play a bridge in the song. They called the bridge the middle eight, even though uh, it wasn't always eight bars long. This one's 11 bars long. They still called it a middle eight. So there's a little problem counting there, but they knew it had to be different. They did some interesting things with the chords in the song. They changed the key, and when the Beatles found out that they could change the key in music, and they found this only by studying all the old show tunes. They found they could change the key. They, they, their music really grew. So it changes from the key of G to the key of C. And when you look at the chorus, the chords for the chorus, so it's a little music lesson, but I have to explain it to you. The chorus goes in the key of G, C to D to G to E minor, C to D to G, each two beats long. Now, when you look at the bridge, it's these chords, each a bar long, D minor 7, G to C to A minor, D minor 7, G to C. So those are each bars long, the other ones are half bars long. What I observed was that D minor 7 is the notes from a piano, D, F, A, C. It's, the F, A, C is an F chord, so it's really an F chord there, but with a different bass note that Paul McCartney played. Now, the F chord would not be the right chord there musically. 
So musically, the D minor seven is a better chord. Paul McCartney, the best musician in the band, played the D there because he knew that was the right note. Now, the, uh, the, once you replace the D minor seven by an F, you find out that the chords are essentially the same. The Beatles took the chords for the chorus and they do two mathematical transformations to it. They moved it up five semitones in pitch and they stretched it out twice as long. The effect of doing those two mathematical transformations subconsciously meant that it was, uh, it held together and yet it was interesting. So it's the math that they do subconsciously that makes it so great. And one of the things that I found out throughout my work is that with music and every great art form, there's always this dichotomy between setting expectations and meeting expectations and surprises. And the Beatles, by far, knew exactly where to draw the line. Just on this note, I'll mention that a while ago I was in Toronto and I was um, hosting a conference and I hadn't met the administrator there. We had spoken over the phone a number of times and we had been in touch by email and I came into the room to meet her for the first time. She shook my hand and she said to me, first thing she said to me was, you're better looking than I expected. <laughs> so I still don't know what to make of that. I don't know whether to thank all the other mathematicians for setting the bars so low. <laughs> but anyways, I guess in real life, surprises and expectations are a good thing. So, I want to play for you a little bit of um, uh, the Beatles playing uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand. I want you to watch John Lennon's left hand. I want to hold your hand. And when I John is playing the F chord there, different from what George Harrison is playing and what Paul McCartney is playing. Why would one guitarist play a different chord from everyone else? I think that John Lennon knew in his mind what was the perfect math chord to go there, subconsciously. And it was the F chord. So he was going to play the F chord. He said in his mind, forget everyone else, or something like that. I'm going to play the right mathematical chord. And that's what he did. So, um, the other, where my story really begins is in 2004, I want to figure out how the Beatles played the opening chord of A Hard Day's Night, which has been a mystery for a long time, for 40 years. So, be, so the song track began with the, with the famous opening chord. We're going to play you a quick little version of it, and then I'll talk a little bit more. So the chord we play won't be the chord that they actually played, but that will be part of the story as well, why we can't. It's been a hard day's night And I've been working like a dog It's been a hard day's night I should be sleeping like a log But when I get home to you I find the things that you do What made me feel all right Ow! Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to tell you this story, which is really where my story began. So the producer said, we knew it would open both the film and the soundtrack LP, so we want a particularly strong and effective beginning. The strong guitar chord was the perfect match. So it seems to close the discussion about the chord, but everyone has tried to figure out how to play the chord. 
One way to play the chord is to put your finger across all the frets and play that one. For time reasons, I won't play each one, but every one sounds different. There's three different ways, at least in the, in the, in the music books. What I knew in, in 2004, I had read a book 10 years earlier, just out of interest, on applications of mathematics. I'm one of those weird people who do that. But there was a whole chapter on math and music, and I filed away in my mind, but in 2004 I thought, maybe there's some scientific way to figure out how the chord was played, because musicians miss notes that are in chords, and they hear notes that aren't there. So pure tones are created by an object moving rapidly back and forth. They're modeled by sine and cosine curves. So this is going to be, for some of you, a nightmare. So you're going to have to pinch yourself, you won't wake up though. It's, it's high school revisited. Sine and cosine curves from high school appear here. And in fact, we can hear, as humans, the pitch, which corresponds to the frequency, how fast the sine and cosine waves go by, and the amplitude, which is how far you go from the middle, is the related to the loudness. So, there is a mathematical process called Fourier transforms that can be used to unravel things. When you hear, what you hear when you hear a chord is you hear all the sounds mixed together. Fourier transforms unravels it. So I used this, and I, when analyzing the chord, I got 30,000 frequencies. A horrible thing, it's almost enough to make you uh, throw up, but I could see the loudnesses. I know that the frequencies that were being played on the guitar would be amongst the loudest ones. There would be noise and harmonics and things like that produced by the physics of sound, but I got a beautiful picture here. Everyone agree? <laughs> to me, it's a beautiful picture. These are the 48 loudest frequencies, and I began to notice things when I did these. So if I look at it, here's one that's particularly loud, this frequency at 150, that's a D note. Undoubtedly, that was played by Paul. And so on. So I started, be, what I did was, this is, it gets even worse for you if you hate math. <laughs> here's a logarithmic function that's built into it. I had to figure out what the notes were. And one thing I found out from these, the, this tells me how far I am away from a certain A note. The amazing thing here is I found out something, one of the reasons you can't reproduce the chords. They finished off with take nine. The producer, George Martin, should have come into the studio and said, lads, time to tune up again. They're out of tune because each one of these numbers should be a whole, an integer, and they're not. So the Beatles were out of tune. It's part of the mystique of the chord. No one asked them to retune. So part of the reason the chord sounds so great is it's out of tune. <laughs> I moved everything to the closest note. I found out all the ones that were, people thought they heard were wrong. There's no bottom G note. So I assigned the notes. I couldn't figure out for George Harrison's 12-string guitar, how did he play it? I had a lot of problem, in particular for these three F3s, and I almost gave up. And then I thought about an assumption. So when you have problems in real life, think about the assumptions that you make, the hidden assumptions. The hidden assumption that I had here was that it was just the Beatles playing. But I realized maybe it's not just the Beatles playing. And in particular, I know pianos have three strings tuned identically, or as identical as possible, under each hammer from the middle on upwards. But it's only from the middle on upwards, so I had the idea, maybe it's a piano in the mix, and that's why you can't reproduce it on guitar. So I immediately ran down to a piano store, and I stuck my head inside the grand pianos to count the strings under the hammers. And before I was thrown out of the store, <laughs> I figured out it was indeed possible, and what I find out from my math is that it tells me the size of the grand piano in Abbey Road Studio that they used to record it. It was a mid-sized piano because it's where it broke. So, I've got some notes for, the, for George Martin, who played the piano undoubtedly on the chord, and John Lennon. So this is the chord that I had published in Guitar Player magazine. When I had it published in Rolling Stone magazine, I tried to get it published in Rolling Stone magazine. They kept it for a while, and they said, we can't publish it, it has math in it. So I had it published, I gave it to Guitar Player magazine, they said, we'll publish it, can you take out all the math? I said, you can't take out all the math, it's like a Harry Potter story <laughs> with magic. So I took out a lot of the math, but I left it there. Last thing I want to end with is the Wall Street Journal came up to interview me, and I said, when you come up to interview me, I wrote a song using mathematical principles that I gleaned from the Beatles' work. So, and uh, I took the ideas, I didn't, it's not a copy of a Beatles song, it takes the ideas like the Beatles did, stretched the ideas, broke them, bent them, in the way that the Beatles did. So I want you to have a listen. I did this with the hopes of writing a song that had they written it back then, it might have been a hit for them. So lofty goals, but it's an exercise for me. It's on, I have a CD out called the song, Songs in the Key of Pi. You can find it on iTunes. <laughs> I've got a book, Our Days Are Numbered, which you can find upstairs. I'll just play this for you and end off here. Oh, one little story. Uh, 
you think, it's a, there's a sad part to the story. You think when you have your 15 minutes of fame and you get on the front page of a national paper, they would use your picture. <laughs> My brother, who's an accountant in Toronto, said someone came up to him the day this was published and said, a great article about your brother, and I, it's unbelievable how much he looks like Paul McCartney. <laughs> have a listen to the song. Jason. Thank you. Have you thought about putting out an album of the Beatles' lost tapes? <laughs> <laughs> that would be fantastic. I bet there's <laughs> treasures there. I bet a lot of people would buy it. <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. <laughs> this way. Let's go this, this way. way. <laughs> 